pretty impressive. Uh, this is a, sort of a teaser for an ongoing series on the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of John. And um, I uh, had thought uh, I would uh, try to do a third podcast every day, and this would be at three o'clock every time. But the more I think of it, I, I just uh, not going to have time to do that. Uh, it's, it wears me out and leaves no time to, to get anything else done. So what I want to do is to finish up the Gospel of John at noon, which I don't think will take that long, given that the it's easier to do in big gulps, more so than uh, the other Gospels, which are, you know, like pearls on a string, and you've got to give my microscopic attention to each one. Uh, I think we can um, get through it pretty quickly. And then I want to go on to that other Johannine item, uh, the, uh, the Apocalypse, the Book of Revelation. But today I want to regale you with a story that is based on it, and I think will get you in the mood uh, for it. This was one that Margaret Barker uh, likes, and uh, so uh, you'll get a chance to uh, to uh, revel in the revelation. Oh gosh, what a terrible pun. Um, let's see, that's not it. Where is this thing? Yes, there, there we are. It's called The Seven Thunders. Apollonius of Tyana had entered Ephesus to teach and to heal. It was true that most of those who flocked to him, for he was well known, were more desirous of being healed in body than uplifted in soul, but the sage knew this was the way of children, and he looked upon mankind as children. Fools, perhaps, but with the foolishness of children, as well as some it had to be allowed with the stupidity of beasts." But then this was the reason for metempsychosis, so that souls might climb the ladder of perfection. Apollonius taught the precepts of the great Pythagoras, and indeed some deemed him the very reincarnation of that worthy, while others hailed him as the son of Proteus, as Pythagoras had been the son of Apollo. A weary-looking woman came to him, dragging a pallet on which lay her son, who was paralyzed in both legs. Apollonius pointed to her and waited for her to speak. She did. O oh, master, I brought to you my poor son, who has never been able to walk. I love him and carry him, but I grow old and tired, and I fear I cannot carry him much longer. I beg you to heal him. Have mercy on us, son of Proteus. Withal, she lowered her eyes before him. The sage closed his eyes for a moment, then replied, saying, What if the cost for the cure you seek were for you to take his infirmity for your own? Would it be worth it to you? Without hesitation, she answered, In truth it would, O Lord, I am ready. Apollonius said, O oh, mother, great is your devotion. You have already paid the price. He stooped by the side of the young man and whispered some words in his ear. The man shuddered as if with sudden cold, and at once he climbed easily to his feet. His mother wept for joy as the two walked away, this time with her leaning upon him as they went. The crowd gasped, then rejoiced with much shouting. The wonder worker went on from there, and his disciple Damis accompanied him. The two came upon a well where a man was beating his slave for some perceived disobedience. Damis flinched as if he had received the blows in his own flesh. Would his master intervene? Apollonius knelt on the ground and gathered a pile of pebbles and withered leaves, holding them in a fold of his robes. Then he approached the two men, both of whom turned to face him. Sir, I would purchase this slave from you. Uh, would this sum suffice? Looking at what the sage held out to him, the slave owner's eyes widened, and he said, 
<laughs> Most certainly, my good man. Here, let me record the transaction, and you may keep the note as a bill of sale. Damas looked on in bafflement as the man cradled the trash Apollonius had traded for the silent slave. As the man strode off with his newfound wealth, Damas gazed at his master, his expression asking his question for him. This man has eyes but for gold. He can see nothing else. And so in this case, though when he reaches his home, things may look different to him. And if he is fortunate, he will come to realize that gold is of no more value than what I gave him. As for you, my friend, and here he turned to the waiting slave, you may go your way, henceforth in servitude only to your own conscience. A few days later, the philosopher and his disciple heard the sound of great mourning as they approached the gates of another city. One standing at the edge of the crowd told Apollonius what it was all about. It seemed a young woman of a noble house had died in the very hour she was to be wed. The groom headed the funeral procession and wept the loudest. Hearing this, the thaumaturge made his way through the multitude and motioned for the bearers to set down the bier on which the dead girl lay. I shall stay the tears you are shedding on her behalf. Murmuring went through the crowd like ripples through a pond. Most thought Apollonius presumed to deliver a eulogy of comfort, but he placed his hand on her exposed throat, whereupon the maiden commenced to cough, spitting up an evil-looking bile. She lived. Her mother rushed to embrace her. Her father appeared relieved, but as if it were he who had escaped some misfortune. Apollonius raised his voice to ring out above the acclaim of the multitude. The maiden took poison rather than wed a man she did not love. At this, her father and her would-be groom both grimaced. She was to join the fortunes of two houses, but she could not abide the man her father chose. If she is forced to wed him now, she will only drink the potion again. The girl got up as a young man forced his way to the front and embraced the maid with joy. Evidently, it was he to whom her heart belonged. Apollonius the sage did numerous such feats wherever he and Damis journeyed, but Damis urged him to conceal himself, for it was rumored that the emperor Domitian was looking to slay him. But he continued undeterred. At Hierapolis, he was met by an embassy of men carrying torches and swords. They recognized him and beseeched him, O oh, son of the gods, our city is beset by violent men. They murder without reason or goal, like wild beasts. Our streets run with blood. He considered their words, then asked, Are these men native to your city, and are they led by a single man? They are men of the city, and known to us, but there is no mob. Each acts alone and in turn. Another arises as soon as the last is slain. Then it is a demon with whom you deal. He casts off one body for another as a man changes his tunic. I see you are pursuing him now. Permit me to join you. Apollonius, clad in simple robes, barefoot, wearing no helmet but a skull cap, seemed an odd volunteer for a vigilante force, but he would soon prove their greatest weapon. The group passed down street after street until they found their quarry at the end of a blind alley. He had none of the look of a cornered beast. Instead, he looked as if he were waiting for them. The torch bearers paused to see what Apollonius would do. 
He stepped calmly toward the murderer, foolishly endangering himself, as it seemed to the witnesses. Come out of him, unclean spirit. I adjure you by the numbers 153 and 888, and enter none other in this city. At this command, the demoniac sank to his knees and began to writhe and to cry out. The words were punctuated by the sounds of crackling flames, though none were to be seen. The possessed man collapsed in a heap, and the echoing voice of the demon, now seeming to come from no single source, spoke, Pious fool! I gladly depart, for I must prepare for the triumph to come. The coming of Leviathan, who sleeps in his house at Rillier. Then it is I who shall be banishing you. There was no more. The sage graciously refused the reward offered him by the city and urged them to give the money instead to the widows of the many murdered by the demon and by those he had possessed, now dead. He did, however, accept the price of passage from the Asian mainland to his next destination, the Isle of Patmos. On board ship, Damis waited till his mentor had finished his daily meditation, then asked, Master, are you now heeding my urgings to hide yourself from the emperor? I am not, my friend, for he cannot harm me, but there is great danger ahead, and not just for us. We go now to inquire of an old friend of mine. It has been many years, and he may not recognize me, but I think he will not turn us away. In this form, I cannot see certain things that he can. I believe he can be of great assistance to us. They had no trouble finding the aged seer. The island was home to two major concerns. One was a tin mine, the other a penal colony. The Roman overseers pressed the prisoners into service in the mine, at least the able-bodied ones. The man the visitors sought was under house arrest adjacent to the main prison. He had arrived on Patmos months before to preach his doctrine to the prisoners. The Romans would not tolerate this and imprisoned him, but he was so old and frail that they decided to treat him gently. Some said he had recruited a few secret believers among the guards, and they allowed their mentor special privileges, such as writing materials. They would bring him letters from the mainland congregations over which he presided and pass his own epistles to the messengers who awaited them outside the prison. The guard to whom Apollonius and Damis were directed turned out to be one of those friendly to the man they sought, and he led them to a small spare cell. Its occupant had done his best to make it as pleasant as possible, but it left much to be desired. The furnishings consisted of little more than a straw pad and a crude chair and writing table, apparently fashioned from a shipping crate. The old man slowly rose and gestured welcome. Who are you, my friends? Damis, this is the elder John, or John the Revelator. He possesses great prophetic gifts. You are well met, friend Damis, and who may you be, sir? I must confess to being Apollonius from Tyana. Some consider me a sage, but it is your wisdom we seek. With all, he bade John return to his chair, while he and Damis happily sat cross-legged on the floor. The elder listened patiently and with rising interest as Apollonius recounted the recent episode of the demoniac and his ominous parting words. You are widely known for your second sight, O John. You can hear the trumpets of angels and the chitterings of devils. 
I am very much hoping that you may know more of these impending horrors and the rising of Leviathan. Can you enlighten us? The elder sighed. I shall open my mouth to speak mysteries hidden from the foundation of the world. The end is the return of the beginning, so I must go back to the beginning. For in the beginning was Leviathan, the father of the Elohim, which is to say the gods. They trembled at his thrashings in the depths of chaos and old night. They feared that he who had begotten them would turn and devour them. Then one of the Elohim, Yahweh by name, stepped forth to issue a challenge to his elders. He would face the dragon in pitched combat if they would vow to reward his victory with the divine throne. Being much afraid, they readily agreed. Yahweh, who is also called Marduk and Indra, Elian Baal and Nodens armed himself with many lightnings and went forth to harpoon the dragon. He was called Leviathan and Rahab, Tiamat and Vritra, Lotan and Cthulhu. Long did they struggle until at last the warrior god impo imprisoned him in the great abyss in his house at Rillier. Kings and priests and sages have sought to blot out these things from the memory of men. But scripture speaks of those who are skilled to rouse up Leviathan. Certain cults have long wished to destroy a world in which they have no share. They crave a freedom from all restraints. When their ancient god returns, they too will be destroyed. But being fools, they do not know their foolishness. Damis ventured to question the old saint, giving him a chance to catch his labored breath. Are these wicked men then leaguing themselves with the unclean spirits to bring about the awakening of this leviathan? And, add, add, added Apollonius, who are these men? Let the wise man reckon the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Apollonius was quick with an answer. I have learned from Pythagoras the deeper meaning of numbers. This is the sum of the name Neron Caesar, is it not? But he is dead these forty years. That is not dead which can eternal lie. Many believe that Nero's foul spirit has retaken the throne of the Caesars under another name. Damis gasped Domitian. The elder nodded gravely. I have heard that it was he who gave the order to confine me, and the angels tell me he is soon to unleash a great persecution against the saints. I have made an account of what I saw and heard and sent it to my seven congregations, directing each to make a copy to retain and to study during the terrible days to come." The wrinkles lining Apollonius's brow deepened as he pondered. Tell me two things, Elder John. Why would the Roman Caesar seek to destroy his own realm? It is his world. He cannot desire the ruin of his own kingdom. And how does he know the means to rouse up Leviathan? Remember, O Apollonius, though he is called Domitian of the house of Flavius, the spirit that animates him is that of the Antichrist Nero. He was struck down by his own guards who cut his throat. His desire now is for vengeance against the empire of the Tiber. 
as to how he knows the secret of releasing the monster, and here a tear traced down his wrinkled cheek, I fear I am to blame. May Christ forgive me on the day he comes in power to vanquish the beast I have helped to unleash. Little surprised the sage of Tyana, but these words shocked him. You? How? I told you I wrote down what was revealed to me. There were many, many revelations that day. One of the most frightful was that of the seven thunders. I heard great thunderclaps, and in my spirit I discerned their meaning, and it was terrible indeed. Here was the secret of Leviathan and how to summon him. I hastened to write it down, as I had all the rest. But after I had sent my scroll to the seven congregations, my angelic guide rebuked me, saying, Seal up what the seven thunders said. They are the crafty interjections of Satan. At once I sent word to the leaders of my congregations, ordering that they strike out the revelation of the seven thunders. I thought I had succeeded, but later I learned that one of them defied me, a man named Diotrephes. He recognized the great danger of the forbidden oracle, but me, being a man who enjoys nothing more than the preeminence, he saw here a rare opportunity. Here the tired old man paused and covered his face in shame and pain. He promised a copy to the, ancient, the agents of the persecutor Domitian in return for protection and patronage. I am told Diotrephes remains in Pergamum where Satan has his throne, but he will make for Rome as soon as his new master summons him there. Then, said Apollonius, turning to Damas, we must find him before he gives the incantation to the emperor. I will pray for you, my new friends. You may have success, for, as you know, Pergamum will be in easy reach once you return to the mainland. I would offer you such accommodations as I myself enjoy, but I fear that if the wrong guard should discover you here, you might become my permanent companion. The voyage was short, and the journey took but a few days once they begged a ride with a wine merchant who had room in his wagon. Apollonius thanked the driver once he and Damas reached Pergamum by laying hands upon his spine and relieving his chronic pain. They found an inn willing to let them bed down in the stable for as long as they needed shelter, while they had no difficult... Uh, Whoops, while they sought out the, the man Diotrephes. He was known as a tanner and a maker of sailcloth, and they had no difficulty locating his place of business, only to find it closed. That boded ill. Apollonius assured Damis, however, that there was another avenue they might pursue. The two of them trod the dusty streets, examining the ground in front of every door. It was a good two hours before they found what they were looking for, a figure made of two intersecting curved lines, coming to a point on one end, crossing at the opposite end, and continuing to form only the beginning of a second oval. It suggested a fish, you recognize this, Damas, do you not? Yes, master. It is the secret sign of our fraternity, whereby the brethren may know that a friend dwells here. But why do we seek another Pythagorean? We do not, my friend. It happens that Christians have adopted the sign of the fish for similar reasons. 
desiring secrecy at a time when the clouds of persecution gather. It affords occasional confusion as one of our brethren may find himself amid Christians or a Christian among Pythagoreans, uh, but neither has ought to fear from the other, as ought to be plain from our recent interview with the elder John. I'm hoping that a Christian of Pergamum, one of John's flock, may help us find this Diotrephes. Damis nodded and said, allow me, giving the door a vigorous knock. When the door opened, a woman's face peeked out from behind it. Whom do you seek, sirs? I do not know you. Apollonius answered, I am sent by John of Patmos. My name is Apollonius. She opened the door wider and allowed her face and form to be seen. A matronly woman with long silver hair piled atop her head and held in place by jeweled combs. I have heard of you, the wizard from Tyana. With a chuckle, Apollonius replied, I prefer the term philosopher, but yes, I am he. I seek him who shepherded your congregation till recently, as I understand it. Suspicion darkened her expression. You are not in league with him, are you? No, my sister. In truth, we aim to prevent him from doing great mischief. She seemed relieved. Now I know why Diotrephes forbade us to receive wandering strangers. Come in, good sirs. They reclined at table, looking about them as their hostess retreated to the kitchen and directed her servants to prepare a meal and directed another to round up a few of her Christian brothers and sisters. Apollonius and Damis were happy to rest their travel-weary bones and to take some refreshment as they waited. When an hour had passed, three more Christians, two young mothers, their babies in tow, and an elderly man arrived. Others must have been busy as laborers, slaves, and shopkeepers. Servants brought a modest spread of Two, uh, sorry, servants brought a modest spread of foods, mainly fruits, cheese, and bread, with one pitcher each of wine and of water. Apollonius and Damis, Pythagoreans, eschewed meat and wine and were delighted with the repast. It is a shame, the old man offered, about Diotrephes, a proud man and in the wrong way. You know what I mean. Damis came to his aid. Yes, the pride of arrogance, not the pride of dignity. That's it. He began with a servant's heart, but in time, as he was entrusted with ever greater responsibility, he lorded it over those who allowed him to. Come, let me show you the man's folly. He rose and led the group to a closed room which housed the space in which the tiny congregation of Pergamum's believers met each Sunday at dawn. There was a kind of cupboard containing a few scrolls, each in its own pigeonhole. Wall murals depicted scenes from the scriptures, and in front, on a pillar beside a lectern, was an expensive-looking marble bust. Apollonius, admiring the workmanship, inquired, Does this represent one of the old patriarchs or one of your prophets, um, Isaiah perhaps? Um, no, the old man replied, it depicts the vain Diotrephes himself. He had it made and placed here. Everyone laughed. Maximilla quipped, it's a good likeness for what it's worth. I think I may use it for a scarecrow. This prompted more laughter. Apollonius came to the point. And where is he now? I saw that his shop is closed. John the Revelator brings, uh, sorry, believes Diotrephes plans a trip to Rome. He thought it best to reveal as little as possible of what was at stake. Planning, said their hostess, whose name she finally told them was Maximilla. He has already departed. Damis looked as if she had slapped him. When did he go? 
one of the young women, Paulina, said, no one has seen him for two days. Apollonius, rising to his feet, said, thank you, my friends. You have been a great help. Our quarry has a head start on us, but we may yet overtake him, I think. Kissing one another's cheeks, the party broke up and returned to their daily routines. When well out of sight of the house, the sage motioned Damis to follow him into an alley between two tenements. Diotrephes means to deliver the papyrus to Domitian in person, as we supposed. There's no time to waste. I understand, Master, but how are we to overtake him at this point? You will seek passage on a ship as he did. As for me, I have other plans, and you cannot go with me now. Rest assured, I would take you with me if I could. We will find one another in Rome. Damis's puzzlement turned into utter amazement when, away from all prying eyes, the son of Proteus vanished from his sight. Damis reminded himself that his mentor was not averse to employing stage tricks on occasion, so he hurried to the mouth of the alley and looked up and down the littered street but saw no one. In that moment, he felt he had woefully underestimated Apollonius of Tyana, whose true nature he had now begun to suspect. With a strange hybrid of confusion and renewed purpose, Damis made for the inn to see if the innkeeper might help him make the necessary connections for the voyage to Rome. Apollonius appeared, though invisible to others, on the road leading into the city. He wanted to observe the people going into and out of the great city, blissfully unaware of the dreadful events about to befall them, that is, unless the wonder worker could use his talents to prevent it. In his unseen form, really a kind of mesmeric aura that simply kept all near him from noticing him, he passed through the gates of Rome amid a group of chained slaves destined for gladiatorial training. Most of those entering Rome were headed toward the great marketplace, but Apollonius continued in the company of a set of white-clad nobles on their way to the Senate. Before the great structure with its great columns, like those which held up the heavens, stood a mob chanting, Increase the dole! These amplified the volume and per fervency of their shouting once once they beheld the handful of senators approaching. But these paid their complaining public no mind as legionaries appeared from nowhere to safeguard their master's passage into the gleaming halls of the legislature. Apollonius tarried here for a few moments, unobserved by the senators, their guards and pages. He watched the self-important mortals sitting on their marble benches and fine purple cushions and thought how like children playing games of pretend they looked. But he had business elsewhere. There were inevitable limits to his abilities when in his present form. He could maintain his concealment, but it would be some time before he could repeat his teleportation feat. Thus, he could not simply appear in the emperor's presence, but such measures were not necessary. He circulated among the senators once the session broke up, listening to discover who might have business with Domitian. There must be a steady stream of them seeking favors for themselves or their home villages. It did not take long to locate what he sought. A tall, gaunt man with iron-gray hair and a confident stride left the building, accompanied by a soldier. Apollonius followed him as he walked. They passed a number of fine statues of previous Caesars, as well as of the heroes and deities of Rome's myths. Here were Romulus and Remus, 
then another depicting Romulus in his exalted form as the god Quirinus. Next was Minerva, then Jupiter, Juno, Mercury, Hercules. Even the ancient Etruscan god Tinia found a place in the ranks of the petrified immortals. At once Apollonius halted and nearly collided with those around him who, of course, could not see him. He almost lost the concentration enabling him to evade their notice when he caught sight of him who had posed for a marble bust in faraway Pergamum, Diotrephes. How could the man have preceded him here? There could be what, but one answer. He too must have had some magical means at his disposal. It could only be that the papyrus of the seven thunders held revelations from its diabolical revealer beyond that which the elder John had implied. Diotrephes must have studied the satanic verses in some depth before arriving here. Had he already delivered it over to his patron Domitian? Entering the palace, the senator, his bodyguard, and an unseen third man proceeded to the station where an officer of the Praetorian Guard screened visitors. The tall man was expected. His name, Publius Janus Garbo, was at the head of the list. The centurion assigned a guard to escort the senator into the presence of the divine Domitian. Had Apollonius not long ago eschewed the taking of life, this would have been a prime opportunity to rid the world of the wicked tyrant and the cataclysm he threatened to create. He was obliged to take a more indirect approach, and for this too he faced a prime opportunity. Domitian sat on his throne of judgment as they walked in. His countenance was stonily impassive, as if it were only a ceramic vessel for an alien consciousness that had been poured in. Swathed in late afternoon shadow, his staring eyes were nonetheless cleary, sorry, easily visible. At first, his un seen observer thought a stray bar of setting sunlight lay across them. But on closer scrutiny, Apollonius saw that the emperor's eyes emitted their own rather baleful illumination. When the tyrant recognized his visitor, he descended the steps from the dais and motioned Garba to join him on a luxurious couch. Domitian was very obviously disturbed, despite the neutrality of his expression. He glanced at his attendants, who were just then lighting the bracketed torches around the audience chamber. When they were finished and left the room, Domitian again faced his confidant and resumed speaking his worries. I knew I should not have trusted the Christian apostate. My spies have learned that he plans to deceive me. He has decided to keep the true papyrus for himself and to give me a forgery that vitiates the crucial lines of the incantation. I confirm this out of the mouth of the scribe whom the cursed Diotrephes paid to fabricate it. My torturers got to the truth quickly enough. They always do. The senator considered what he had heard, then spoke. My lord, I believe I understand your own intention, and you know that I am at one with you. As the high priest of the secret cult of Pluto, my goals are very much the same. I, too, wish to see the titan Saturn, whatever we like to call him, rise from Galia to sink the dry lands and raise up the sunken realms. If this man Diotrephes wishes to chant the invocation himself, how does that harm our plans? The same result will follow, will it not? Such is the expectation of my informants on the spirit plane. Let me tell you, my brother, what difference it will make. 
when Leviathan or Saturn, what have you, arises in his ancient glory, the man who releases him from the bottomless pit will rule the world as his vicar on earth. That must be me. Of course, you will reign at my right hand. The Titan will rise in any case. That is true enough. But you and I must rise with him, so you see. The emperor stopped mid-sentence and gaped at the sight of Apollonius the sage suddenly standing before him. Senator Garba um, leaped to his feet and tried to call for the guards who stood on duty outside the audience hall. But the senator found he could not speak. That was Apollonius's doing. Gentlemen, give me a moment and hear me out. You have naught to fear from this old man, but I think you will want to hear what I have to say. Domitian set aside the outrage that should have moved him to have this interloper seized and killed on the spot, along with the guards whose incredible laxity had permitted him to infiltrate. He reasoned that a man who could thus reveal himself was likely someone privy to secrets he needed. Say on, wizard, we will hear you. My lords, forgive me, but I fear you have fallen into the same error which has captured the upstart Diotrephes. Do not let yourselves take offense, but learn from your mistake. The being whose advent you avidly await cares not for any mere mortals, except in so far as he may use them as pawns for his own ends even you, the mighty of the earth. If Leviathan returns, there will be no one to rule, no, hu no one human at any rate. He will have no need of you or of any viceroy. Do you not see that? You are seeking but to hasten your own obliteration. Both Romans sat in silence for a long time. Confusion and dismay marked their faces. It took no prophetic telepathy to see that the warning of Apollonius was nothing that had not occurred to them before, though neither had mentioned it to the other, or even allowed themselves to face the possibility. If, if justice is blind, it is no more blind than ambition. Finally, Domitian stood to his feet. His face, finally animated, registered an attitude of good fellowship, which was almost certain to be a feigned pose. A man in his position never displayed his true feelings, but wore whatever mask each situation seemed to require. He placed a powerful hand on Apollonius's shoulder and spoke to him, looking him in the eye. I believe you are the renowned Apollonius, the magician from Tyana. You are a man with great knowledge of secret matters. I will consider what you have said. Meanwhile, allow me to provide you with an apartment here in the palace. By now the senator had regained his voice and gone to summon the guards. The emperor pointed to two of the men, saying, You, Septimus, and you, Gaius, attend our distinguished guest. He will be with us for a few days. Apollonius understood the purpose of the guards assigned him was to keep an eye on him and to control his movements. Domitian said to him, I will speak with you again when I have decided my next step. Then he turned to Garba, placed his arm around the senator's thin shoulders, and walked away. Some weeks passed as Apollonius, essentially under house arrest, redeemed the time with meditation to strengthen his abilities. He surmised that Domitian, paying no heed to his words of caution, was frantically searching for Diotrephes, hoping to seize the papyrus from him before he could use it himself. And why had he not? Perhaps the incantation was in some strange glossolalic tongue difficult to pronounce correctly? If so, Apollonius can imagine Diotrephes' fear of experimenting with the formula. 
And it was even so. Shortly after his arrival in Rome, the scheming Diotrephes had sought out the Sibyl, whose famed oracular prowess seemed to offer his best hope for getting the conjuration right. But the would-be awakener of Leviathan came away from her grotto with only a cryptic prophecy. Apollo's spirit speaketh now, to work the work he'll show thee how. Be sure thou speakest without fear, and if thou dost, the god shall hear. But Diotrephes reflected how this left him exactly where he was before. He supposed the Sibyl meant to assure him that the exact pronunciation mattered less than the earnestness with which he uttered the spell. But how could he not be filled with apprehension that he was not speaking with no grain of doubt? Um, ah, it was all quite maddening, just like that baffling promise of Christos that one might gain any desired boon if he prayed without doubt, as if it were possible to banish all qualms. A cruel joke, and so was this. Did he dare go through with his plan? It might be too great a risk, and come to think of it, perhaps an unnecessary one. Had he not already gained formidable powers with the aid of the papyrus, even from the lesser mysteries it contained? Perhaps this world need not pass away to usher in a new one for him to rule. Perhaps this one would be satisfactory. Apollonius had the honor of a private interview with the emperor, several such meetings, in fact. Invariably, Domitian's polite conversations uh, eventuated in offers to pay the sage to teach him the art of going unseen, as well as other abilities he rightly suspected his guest possessed. But Apollonius was steadfast in his refusals. Today, however, the tyrant tried a different lure. I believe, sir, that you have an assistant called Damis. At least I hope I am not mistaken, for I have gone to some considerable trouble to locate him. He is at present being held by my guards, awaiting your decision, even as I do. You are in a position to do a good deed both for your disciple and for your emperor, who himself asks only to become your disciple. Teach me what I wish to know, O Apollonius, or I cannot be too optimistic about your apprentice's future. Uh, Septimus, you may bring him in now. The Praetorian guards appeared with a manacled Damis in tow. He had plainly been pummeled, though recently washed, his cuts and bruises treated. Apollonius was both delighted to see his young friend and dismayed at the treatment dealt him. Damis made to greet his master, but one of the guards dealt him a silencing blow. Domitian began again. Now we will see if... But a commotion outside preempted his threat. What is it? Guards, give me a report. As the doors opened for some of the men to leave and investigate, the sounds became louder and more distinct. There were crashing noises as well as the roaring of a conflagration, and also much screaming as of a panicked crowd stampeding here and there. The guards pivoted and re-entered the audience chamber, having been intercepted by other soldiers on their way in to tell their lord what transpired without. By Hecate, will no one tell me what is afoot? Domitian slapped the face of a stammering guard. The shaken man replied, voice uneven, I Your Majesty, you will c call me mad, but here it is. The very streets of Rome are erupting. Fire rages everywhere, but the worst is... The worst is, damn you, tell me, or I will strike off your head this very minute. My lord, the gods have returned. 
I knew we had waited too long. The accursed Diotrephes has completed the chant, and the terror has begun. If you fools had been able to find him, it would have been I who... Just then Publius Janus Garba rushed through the cordon of soldiers, breathlessly exclaiming, No, Lord Domitian, it is not that. He means the gods of Rome. Their stone statues have stepped off their bases and are wreaking havoc with their marble thews. The soldiers are no match for them. Some sorcerer commands them. Domitian's gaze turned away and he stared at nothing, the light dawning within. It is Diotrephes nonetheless, and it is good news for us, Garba. It means he has been unable to master the spell to rouse up Leviathan. Compared to that, what is going on in the streets is mere trickery. Our next move must be to wrest the papyrus from him. Yes, my lord, but something must be done to stop the present chaos. The people may rise up or, and here he looked worriedly at the soldiers with them in the room, the Praetorian Guard. Of course, of course, Senator, you were right. Other matters must wait, but what to do? Apollonius spoke up. I believe I may be of some help, your highness. Let us go outside. Domitian looked both puzzled and relieved. He gestured to the soldiers who formed a protective ring around their emperor, the senator, and the two philosophers. The party exited the great building and descended the marble steps to the street. About this time, an astonishing sight emerged from around the street corner. An insignificant-looking man whose balding, chinless likeness Apollonius and Damas had seen before drove a golden chariot drawn by mighty griffins. He, too, was flanked by fearsome defenders, only these were ten feet tall and bore the traditional images of the Olympian gods. Even the emperor recoiled at the sight. Apollonius stepped through the ring of Praetorian guards as if he had parted a flimsy curtain. Most impressive, Diotrephes, for a beginner. But haven't you frightened these poor Romans quite enough? With a display of complex gestures, the sage caused the massive illusion, for that is what it was, to drain away. And then it could be seen that the shivering Diotrephes rode only in a miserable apple cart pulled by a pair of goats. There had been no damage, no destruction, no fire, only panic induced by mesmeric phantoms. Domitian looked amazed but was not paralyzed by astonishment as his soldiers were. He, his barked orders snapped them out of it. Seize him! Surge him! The guards secured the no longer impressive little man with ease, then stripped his clothing off him as if he were a slave on the auction block. A few moments of turning pockets inside out and ripping seams disclosed what Domitian was lurking, looking for. In triumph, he held aloft a sealed scroll, small in size and easily concealed. I have it now, and with it a greater throne than Rome's. Apollonius dared interrupt the madman's exultation. Uh, but, sire, you forget. Your monstrous master will by no means honor your service. He will cast you aside as a man dismisses a harlot when he is done with her. Domitian's eyes blazed with the light Apollonius had glimpsed when he first saw the man in his throne room weeks before. You do not fool me, you old charlatan. You never did. You wanted this power for yourself, but you shall not trick me. What Diotrephes could not or dared not do, I dare. Damas was alarmed, but Apollonius seemed to expect some outcome and patiently awaited it. The emperor fingered the seven waxen seals and saw that one had already been broken. 
no doubt by Diotrephes, who must have feared opening the scroll any farther. Domitian fumbled with the second till it broke apart and crumbled. He paused for a moment, waiting to see what might happen next. What did happen was the rapid spraying out of a stream of black smoke, which expanded till it formed the cloudy outline of a great black war horse, which reared menacingly over the emperor. To his credit, Domitian did not cower. Is this another of your parlor tricks, charlatan? At once the figure of a featureless rider appeared astride the still solidifying steed. Wordlessly he unsheathed his blade and swept it back and forth through the air. Blue lightning flashed from it. At the sight of this, Domitian's bravado fled from him and he made to run but one of the leaven bolts caught him right between his shoulders and he fell headlong. His guards were afraid to approach him till the dark horseman dissipated into fading mist. Then one dealt beside the body, turned it over and regarded the face. He lives, great Caesar lives, hail Caesar. Apollonius had stooped down too and, re and retrieved the papyrus scroll from the ground. No one made a move to prevent him, not even Domitian, who was returning to full consciousness with surprising swiftness. You are Apollonius of Tyana? I seem to recognize you, though I'm sure we've never met. Apollonius took his offered hand and helped him up. Do not trouble yourself, my lord. You have not been yourself for some time. Let us talk when you have recuperated. Apollonius and Damas were soon on their way again, making for the harbor where a grateful Domitian had arranged for a comfortable voyage back to Asia and then passage overland to Pergamum, where they felt obliged to inform the Christians what had befallen their one-time leader, now assigned to stable duty in Caesar's palace and to spread the news of the emperor's pledge to no more persecute them or the followers of any religion. Apollonius reached into the folds of his robes and drew forth the cursed and coveted scroll. This shall no more trouble the world of men. He hurled it mightily into the salty air. In mid-arc, the rolled papyrus exploded into blinding flame, a miniature comet. Damas could contain himself no longer. Master, I have to know what happened to the emperor. To all appearances, was he not struck dead? And yet he was taken up alive, and his madness had been driven from him. This was your doing, was it not? Alas, I cannot take credit for the feat. It was the scroll itself that struck him down. At least poor Diotrephes, being such a fool, had the sense to study what little of the text he dared to read before attempting to draw upon its powers, and you saw what he did even with its lesser mysteries. He must have feared he would not have been equal to the challenge of the greater arcana. But Domitian, or the entity we knew as Domitian, was by no means so cautious. Accustomed to commanding at a whim, he ventured to wield the scroll like a magic bludgeon, and it destroyed him. Damis was not satisfied, however. What do you mean, master? Destroyed? But he lives. Domitian lives, but that which possessed him has been destroyed. Do you recall what the revelator said concerning him? Domitian had been taken over by the vengeful ghost of the bloodthirsty Nero. The horseman has banished Nero's spirit to the pit from whence it strayed. It was he who moved Domitian to his crimes and persecutions. Quoth Damas, We owe a great debt to the Christian seer John. With his help, we have turned back the predicted tribulation. 
And yet it was that reign of terror which was to usher in the return of their Christ. That will be a blow to him, surely. We have not cheated him of the return of his Lord, Damis, for if you are willing to accept it, I am he. Okay, um, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, it's a little bit of revelation, and it worked out to the minute, uh, exactly an hour. Uh, let's see. Um, Z. Stallone asks, is there a connection, I guess that of Apollonius and Damas, with Gnosticism and Apocalypticism? Actually not. Uh, <laughs> uh, Pythagoreanism and uh, the like. Uh, when was Revelation, Info Junkie asks, uh, when uh, was uh, Revelation, whoops, where did it go? Uh, uh, when was Revelation written, aside from the Essene sect? Was there a tradition of the end times, myths, and the monotheistic religions of the Levant? Oh, you bet there was. Uh, there, there was a lively and pretty long tradition of a apocalyptic works, visions of the heavens and uh, you know, the stars and where the, the rainbow and the snowflakes were kept and where the angels were and the, the very throne of God and so on. And uh, visions of uh, the pit of hell and those who were damned uh, there or uh, visions of the future, what was going to happen. Some apocalypses were uh, mainly tours of the heavens, in short, just a kind of a, a way of a, of a natural philosopher, right? Uh, somebody who thought about nature and the way the world was made, but had no observational technology to speak of, no telescopes or anything. So they just figured it out, just like the ancient Ionian philosophers did. Uh, and uh, so that's what uh, some of them were others uh, with the revelations of the future. Those tended to be like Daniel, um, actually narratives of events in the real author's past, but written in the future tense so that they would appear as prophetic predictions by a still earlier uh, prophet. Uh, and you can usually tell when those things were written when the predictions, quote unquote, fall off the ledge, right? When they start predicting and, hey, wait a minute, this never happened. Bingo. The, uh, the writer was trying to get you to think he had the predictive power by predicting, I'd say post-dicting, uh, the, um, these events that had actually already happened. Uh, and there were loads of these. Uh, there were several books of Enoch, uh, at least two of Baruch, Apocalypses of Elijah, and uh, all, all sorts of them. And uh, not only in the biblical framework, uh, there were Indian and uh, Muslim uh, apocalypses. Uh, there was an Egyptian one. When Revel, uh, this is Info Junkie. Um, oh, what was this one? No, it's the one we're just doing. Aaron Zach. Was the canonicity of the Book of Revelation debated by the bishops of the? Uh, seas of Rome, Constantinople, Antioch, Alexandria, and Jerusalem. Well, I'm not sure of the specific ones, but there was big controversy for a long time. Uh, once they had pretty much settled on the other 26 writing being the New Testament, uh, apparently Polycarp had already included Revelation, but not every, that, that wasn't official. Right. Uh, in fact, it didn't become the official list until 367 under uh, the decree of um, Bishop Athanasius, which everybody was supposed to follow. But uh, a lot of the books were still debated for a long time. Uh, should the Shepherd of Hermas be uh, considered uh, about uh, the uh, epistle of Barnabas, the gospel according to the Hebrews? Well, they had a lot of fans, but ultimately they didn't ma uh, manage to make it in there. The Apocalypse of Peter and so on and so on. There were a lot of them. Uh, 
not necessarily considered heretical, but, but thought of as pious forgeries. Of course, most of the New Testament books are too, but they didn't know that, right? But the, finally, it came down to the fact that uh, the Eastern Mediterranean churches uh, could accept a lot of stuff, but they just couldn't bear the book of Revelation. They said, well, what the hell is this stuff? Uh, the the uh, Western churches thought it was okay, but uh, they didn't like the epistle to the Hebrews, and uh, but the Eastern church did. So finally, they did some horse trading and said, well, if you'll accept that one, we'll accept this one. And this was around 600 A.D., uh, and even today, there are some outliers, like uh, one of the Armenian churches, the uh, uh, the Monophysite church of the Armenians. Uh, they have 3rd Corinthians in their canon. The Ethiopian uh, Monophysite church has several more books in their canon. So it's still not universal, but uh, most everybody accepted Revelation by uh, about 600 A.D., it had been around for, uh, you know, 400 years at least. Hmm. Uh, you're working overtime today, well, Welsh backgammon said. You bet, and um, I'm getting kind of pooped. Uh, Aaron, Zach, how do we know that Babylon mentioned in the book of Revelation is Rome and not historical Babylon. Well, uh, mainly because Babylon was no longer that relevant to the early Christians. Uh, and uh, the Babylon, the great harlot, is described as uh, sitting on seven hills and being a great magnet of international trade. Uh, it goes into great detail about that. And as far as I know, that didn't fit Babylon anymore. And, uh, but they, they used to call Rome Babylon, uh, partly in case anybody was listening that would find this subversive. What, you're talking about, you're, you're waiting for the destruction of Rome? Hey, that's not very patriotic. You know, there's room on the cross for you. Uh, and so, uh, Babylon, that's what we mean. So, so it's possible, but it seems to me, uh, Reb, uh, Jerusalem, <laughs> what am I saying, uh, uh, Rome is more likely. Um, Aaron Zach says, what book, in your opinion, could have replaced the book of Revelation? If you could replace the book of Revelation, what would you have, what would you replace it with? Uh, well, the apocalypse of Peter or Paul, uh, he had one too, uh, they're kind of like Dante's Inferno. Uh, that would be pretty horrifying stuff, the specific torturous uh, punishments assigned to various crimes and sins. Uh, but uh, I don't know, maybe that would be uh, edifying to some folks. Um, uh, let's see. Well, there was, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Gee, I, I'm not really sure what to say about that. Uh, I guess if I could just replace it with another early Christian book, not necessarily another apocalypse, uh, I would kind of like to have seen the epistle of Barnabas in there, and uh, which is very interesting in its own right. Well, I got to get going because I'm uh, doing the Bible Geek in two hours, and I'm kind of beat already. So I hope to see you then. And uh, please subscribe if you haven't and become a member on, uh, what is it? Uh, oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you.